everyone, welcome back to Pin the Q Podcast. Very special episode here today. I am in Indy, my very first time in Indianapolis for the uh, FDIC. And Chief, absolute honor to be uh, absolute pleasure to be in your presence. But uh, <laughs> this man <laughs> needs no kids, uh. this man needs no introduction. Uh, this is Chief Billy Goldfeder and uh, a legend in the fire service. And uh, truly an honor for you to be on my little program here. No, absolute thrill. Thank you very yeah, much, Chief. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely, sure. So your first FDIC. This is my first one. It's my forty second. Wow. <laughs> forty second. Let's see. Black hair, gray hair. You know, yeah, it, it's, it's <laughs> well, it's black, but it's thinning. Okay. okay. And there's a little bit of gray is coming off to the side. Uh, so you're screwed. Yeah, I'm, I'm already on that. <laughs> I'm already on the way on the way down. So um, this is an exciting FDIC for me uh, because I got to see what hot classes were all about. So I got to do two of those. Monday, I did the real-world fire ground operations. Phenomenal. Who were your instructors? Oh, you I mean, you put okay. me on the spot. That's okay. I don't yeah. remember all of them. I'm, you know, I'm terrible with names. Okay. But, you, uh, you know what? You put it in the byline when you post it. I absolutely will. Yeah. Um, actually, I want to do a separate show just for FDIC and Excellent. kind of talk about my experiences. Very nice. But uh, that was great. And then from there, I did the two four-hours yesterday. Um, when I had truck emergencies, another great class. Uh, and then I got to meet some of my idols growing up, like Captain Morris, oh, FDNY okay. Rescue One. Fantastic. What then good, I, good guy. I go into the next room, you know, and uh, he's like, how you doing? I'm uh, Captain Morris from FDNY, younger guy. I'm like, yeah, you know. Yeah, son, right? Yeah. <laughs> I go, any relation to Captain Morris in the other room? That's he goes, my dad. that's my dad. <laughs> that's like, holy crap. And he placed his dad at Rescue One. Yeah. But, but what's amazing to me is, uh, and that's what I love about the fire service, right? You, you get to meet individuals like that. Oh, and they're salt to the earth. And you wouldn't do it unless you did FDIC. And and, and if you saw him walking down the street, he just he, there's no bravado with right. him. He's just both of them. They're phenomenal captains, and and he's now a chief in Connecticut. Oh, is he the really senior? Yeah. Oh, good for him. Yeah, yeah. But but that was my uh, that was my little experience at FDIC, and it's just been it's, it's been really cool. rewarding. Yes. And I get to meet you, Chief, which was yeah, I've been watching you, <laughs> geez, for so long on these training videos and everything, and uh, it's super exciting. Well, FDIC is a big reunion. It is. Uh, in many respects, uh, you know, it's catching up to each other, seeing each other, uh, meeting the people you read about, meeting the people you watch in videos and stuff. Right. And uh, it's it's fantastic. And, you know, I've never missed one and, and would like to just keep going as long as I can. But it's uh, it's a real thrill to be here. Well, listen, your name is synonymous with uh, FDIC and, and anybody who has an opportunity to, to meet you is is, uh, is lucky, in my very opinion. Very lucky. In my very opinion, lucky. very lucky. Very lucky. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, agree. I, re- I mean it, though. It's, uh, it's good stuff. So, Chief, how the heck did this all start for you? You said 42 years here at FDIC. Yeah, so as a kid, um, <clears throat> I was born in Chicago. And I was adopted, so I was then brought to New York by, the folk, by my parents, as far as I was concerned. Sure. And so something to do with Chicago and the Chicago fire, must, something must have happened. Right, right yeah. But uh, growing up in Long Island, uh, I always heard the fire horns, you know, when the horns went off and the whistles blew. And for some reason, I just never did not have an interest. I mean, this is since I'm a baby. Uh, and my parents, uh, who are now both deceased, but would always tell me stories. That t- it's all I was interested in. And uh, that reflected on my school grades. And uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me too. And, and, you know, back then, I, we didn't have OCD or ADD. It was just like, pay attention, <laughs> smack in the head, right? And, yeah, it's uh, a so I got smacked a lot. Uh, and I barely crept through school because my whole focus was always the fire trucks, the apparatus, and stuff like that. So I graduated. I went to school. In, I went to high school. Was allowed to leave class when the whistle went off. And oh, all cool! That, so which was great. Uh, all I had to do was have passing grades. Right. So you know, I squeaked by with <laughs> D minuses and stuff. We and, have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I then. Uh, uh, Went to uh, college. I uh, worked as a dispatcher. Uh, worked for the sheriff's office. I uh, was a volunteer firefighter. Blah blah blah. And um, went. Uh, that was down in Florida, actually. And I went back to Long Island, which was my home. And uh, I went to Florida because at that time Broward Community College had one of the better fire programs back in the day. Cool. So I found that out. And went down there. So I got some, you know, fire school and stuff. So. I went back to Long Island because I really felt I wanted to go back there. I got a job with ISO. Uh, doing fire protection engineering, cool. uh, evaluating fire departments, helping set their rates. That was a great job. Sounds like it. It was like a five-year yeah. fire buff job. Just go visit fire stations and talk to them. That's what I get to do, and I love it. That was the best, yeah. yeah. And then I was with the uh, with the department that when I was a little boy, I'd hear the horns. I always wanted to go join there because no it was kidding. my hometown. So 
I belong to uh, Manhasset Lakeville. I'm still affiliated with Manhasset Lakeville even after joining in 1977. Wow. And, uh, I mean, I'm not an active member, but I still have no, the roles no. and all that stuff. Sure. And uh, so I did that and then um, went to work for ISO uh, simultaneously for that f- couple-year period or five years and said, you know, I, I want to do this full-time. So taking the FDNY test was always something in my radar, but I had very poor eyesight, and back then there was no LASIK, so it just really was not an option. So with the experience I got with Manhasset Lakeville, and we were doing you know, 50, 75 fires a year, and now they're doing you know, 50, 75 fires in 10 years. It's, the world is changing. Sure, right? sure. And so I uh, started applying for chief's jobs. I just thought, was, was going to hurt, right? Yeah. And I actually got hired as the chief of communications. I had a very strong background in, in 911, dispatch, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and because of the ISO work, uh, and I got hired as the uh, chief of communications in Manatee County, Florida, put their first 911 system in. So I did that from 1982 to 1987. Now, I, when I got down there, I still had to ride fire trucks. <laughs> yeah. So there were fire districts in that area what they called uh, fire protection districts, you know. And uh, so I got hired as the assistant chief, uh, and I was a lieutenant in Long Island. Okay. So, so I was, yeah, I, after a couple of years, I became a company officer. And I got hired as assistant chief of this 100-square-mile rural fire district. That's and I, cool. I knew nothing from water shuttles and nothing, so it was a right, great right. learning opportunity. Uh, so I stayed down there for five years, and uh, it was great. Uh, that fire district, when I was there, excuse me, had a, about a three hundred thousand dollar year uh, budget. Now it's nineteen million dollar. Wow! Budget. It's all grown up. I seventy five was grown through there, so it's and I still go back and I still you know like the one of my probies and who became a lieutenant is now the chief of this whole operation. So we're still I, I maintain long term relationships and I, I, that, that's very important to me. So I uh, was down there and uh, saw an opportunity in Virginia in Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, it was a uh, big combination service. Uh, and uh, went up there for nine years. Uh, and at that point, I was feeling like, you know, great. I, I, I kind of, you know, got the front desk job and all that stuff as the, uh, as the uh, head of fire and rescue. And I had, you know, like 19 volunteer companies. I had a fire rescue commission. I had a county commission. I blah, blah, blah. I was you had all this. You were in charge of all that. Well, the problem was it was too much. Yeah, sounds like it. I didn't feel like a firefighter. Yeah, that's an administrative job. Exactly, and I was too young. Yeah. So I saw a couple jobs, got interviewed within one week for three chief's jobs, uh, one Colorado, one Connecticut, and um, one in uh, Ohio. So I've been in Ohio now since uh, 95. Were you married then? First time. Okay. (laughs) That's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a factor in the equation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is wonderful. She's the mother of my kids, but it just didn't click with my constantly running yeah. and fire trucks and firefighting and training and all that. So um, I was, I've was i been in Ohio since um, 1995. I was chief of a, a joint fire district. When that's what I was hired for. Okay. Uh, one part township, part city. And they fought with each other. They didn't like each other. <laughs> So they broke the district up, naturally. They'll go your way, you know, uh, and I'll go my way. Sure. That was pretty devastating in many respects. And right around that time... Uh, um, was that during the time you were trying to get everything together? Oh, yeah. We uh, had a good department. We had a yeah. great department. Yeah. 50 square miles, a couple of fires. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of rocking and rolling. It was really good. But long story short, because I could sit and ramble about this all day. Um, I've been with the uh, Loveland Sims Fire Department since 2000. Uh, starting as battalion chief, uh, and now I'm deputy. Good for you. And there's a couple deputies, a couple of us, and uh, absolutely loving it. Um, I am, ge- I have a genetic defect where I cannot get along with city managers, so it's better for somebody to be above me. <laughs> <laughs> I've come to that conclusion, <laughs> and I got the best boss who does that too, and he's also very much into fire operations and stuff, so I'm in a real good place. So I guess it's fair to ask you, um, the fire service is extremely important to you. I mean, this is, it's your life. Yeah, some would say it's more important than anything to me, but if they know anything about me, my family's the most important thing to me. I've got uh, five kids, uh, three of my own, two of Terry's. When we got married, they became my sons. Uh, so I've got uh, my oldest daughter, and they were all here last year. I was very, very honored to receive the uh, 
FDIC Fire Engineering Lifetime Achievement Award last year. So it's amazing. on stage was my grandkids, six six grandkids oh, and that's, my wife. What did that mean to you? That was my lifetime achievement, these little knuckleheads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it meant, it me, you know what, I'm, I... Sometimes people say, well, how do you, you know, move up in the fire service? That was never the plan. The, the plan was to speak up and do things I believe in and what I like. And that's why I've had a few jobs. I've, you know, I've pissed off a few city managers in my career. But when you're passionate about something, you you're going to do that. That is exactly right. What I didn't have at the time was the wisdom for balance. And I'm not sure I have it today. But I know I didn't have it back then. But I didn't care back then. Right, you were passionate. If I needed staffing, if I needed equipment, nothing I'm at. Well, Parks and Rec, I don't give a rat's ass about Parks and Rec. That, right. That's Parks and Rec's problem. Right. Okay, I have a measure. You know what? You can have all the parks you want. But if I don't have a good fire and rescue service, I can't take care of the people in the park. And that's how I respond. That's how I looked at everything. Yeah. And that perturbed people sometimes, but whatever. But it's 100% correct. I mean, uh, you know, when you have well, to. Well, we're going to agree with that. Yeah. Well, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I get, but we're not the people managing. We know we don't have the, the strings. Right, right. The now we, I, I will tell you where I'm at now. We have amazing support by our city and our township government, uh, and much of that is due to our fire chief, who is he's been there forever, and he's younger guy than me, but he knows uh, the ways, the means, the politics, and he's phenomenal. And we enjoy very good funding. Uh, we're well taken care of, but we also deliver one hell of a product to the community. Yeah, um, and, and and you think your focus on that is the uh, the training in your in your members? <clears throat> my focus is was my focus is safety and health, uh, and I we also we're primarily a career department, but we have a volunteer unit of about twenty, and they fall under my command as well. And they're, they're some of the greatest people ever. What we did a couple of years ago is the chief, and, and again, smart guy, and I got no reason to suck up. I mean, I'm at the stage right no, now. No, you don't. <laughs> okay, I'm telling you the truth about no. my boss. I love it. But he... <clears throat> you, hear that, you hear the music. Yeah, I heard the siren out there. You pin the cue. <laughs> so um, he came to me one day and said, what do you think about forming a... We form a volunteer company within our department. And, of course, my big concern was the career members, but we set it up where the, the volunteers wouldn't be a threat to them. And Because uh, you're dealing with the unions, right? Well, the career personnel... Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So we... First of all, we got great full-timers, too. They, most of them come from volunteers, so it's not a big deal. Right. But we just want to make sure that was not an issue. Sure. So what we did was uh, we created what we call our emergency service unit, uh, and they cannot be interior firefighters, and they cannot provide primary patient care. Okay. And that takes the whole threat away. Bothers yeah. nobody. North Plainfield has something similar, um, but they call them callmen. Callmen, fire just learned police. Of this. There's all kinds of yeah. Yeah. How the community get involved, and that was my boss's intent. Was you know, we got a lot of great full-timers and stuff, but none of them live in the community. Some can't sure. afford to and stuff. So let's get people within our community. And now we have a, a great group. We've got uh, – uh, it's led by a guy who's retired lieutenant colonel from the Army. So wow. he kind of runs a tight ship. That's cool. And uh, his lieutenant uh, is a um, – uh, an engineer with uh, General Electric, and we've got like 18 active volunteers, and they're toned out. And this is, a, a, I think, a real uh, kind of a secret to the success. They're toned out on structure fires, okay. box alarm, and they're toned out on any accident with entrapment, and they're toned out on anything in the interstate. So they're almost assigned to a box alarm? They're always assigned Okay. to any structure response. Cool. Uh, or you, as you would call a, a box alarm, right. any accident with entrapment, anything on the interstates we cover. So we're not toning them out for every run. Yeah, the CO so alarms not, and all Exactly, and that's yeah. what's burning out a lot of volunteers. I mean, 100%. automatic alarms. And this, you know what? You bite the bullet and you hire career people the right way, it'll work. Some keeping their heads in the sand about the whole not responding issue. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things I like to I'm, I'm starting to see now, which I like and agree with, and I've done... I've done both, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult for me to to see these firefighters that are responding to calls with their windshields frosted over. They're leaving their house. They're trying to get to the firehouse like hell. And then some of them aren't making it, right? Some of them aren't making it to the firehouse. And those individuals, and I say to myself, you know, we probably could be doing better at that and oh, and, and having and staff, even if you're volunteer, but have a staff. Even exactly. Staffing is the key. And, and this makes enemies and makes brothers and sisters fight and all that crap. But... The fact is that responding from home in 2019, other than in extremely rural areas, passe, that's history. If you join to serve, then serve means we have to adjust how we operate. You know, I'll go visit a fire department, a volunteer fire department, 
and it's all built up and mid rises, high rises, you know. And I said, you know, I, I love talking to the old timers, especially. Me too. Yeah. And I say, you know, has a lot changed since you start? Oh, yeah, but you know, for two hours they're talking, right? Sure. And then I look, and they're still blowing a whistle and setting tones off, wait for people to show up for a run. Now there's technology out there. You know, I am responding. Yeah. Um, Act nine one one. Uh, but still, you still have to get there. And it's time to change, you know, in, in the D.C., Baltimore area. The volunteers figured it out a long time ago. Staff your station. Do yeah. it like a shift. And that way everyone is helping out instead of the same eight or ten people making 90% of the runs. Right. And as those eight or ten people can't afford to live in the community, they get another job somewhere. And now you're just hitting the tone, hitting the tone, hitting the tone. I was listening to a fire somewhere uh, a couple weeks ago, or actually last weekend, uh, where the RIT team took 30 minutes to respond. That's not a RIT team. That's, that's like a, not. That's like a social engagement, right? I mean, it's not a RIT team. No. And and the nearest, the, the company that finally got out for the RIT team was like seven or eight fire departments away. And and the reason we don't change is because we don't want to change what we like. But it's not what about what we like. It's what's needed in the community. And what's best for everybody. You know, you join to serve. Then here's how you're now going to start serving. Sure. You know what? Every Monday night is your duty night. You're here from 6P to 6A. Uh, the fire commissioners are going to have a stipend, so you get your meal. We're going to build some bunks, okay? And it builds morale. And and every fifth weekend, you've got the duty crew. And, and that's how you do it. And I, it does build morale, absolutely. It, it does. And, and I know, and I am not bashing the volunteer service because no. I am a volunteer and I also do the career stuff. But what I like about, you know, um, the volunteer aspect and being manned in the firehouse or station there is everyone gets to eat together. Like you said, we ever get to train together and you're staying with your core people. So you always know your duty crew. And if, listen, if, if it mixes up, no big deal, but at least you're getting to work with people exactly. and see what their capabilities are. And we're not killing ourselves trying to get to the firehouse. Exactly. Right. And, and again, you know, I ask people, so it's 10 o'clock in the morning, your house is on fire. Your kids are in the house. Now, how about how about that response system? Right, right. Well, you know, forget what you know. And you, you know what it is? It's change. that we've been doing it like this for, since sure. you know yeah. since the fifties. We've been doing it like this since yeah. the seventies. Well, you know what? But that, you're right. It's it's time to reevaluate. If that you whole go thing. back in the fifties and the sixties, nothing is the same no. as it used to be except no. us. Yeah, some of these towns had one. I, I forget who I was talking to, and I, I hate that. But I was talking to somebody recently, and they were saying, "Hey, look, you know." volunteer company in this particular rural area works because they have one traffic light. They can get there within like three to four minutes. And, and they have the, 50 calls last year. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and compare that to like a town that, that I volunteer for, which is, they get a lot of calls, sometimes six, seven a day. Uh, and then I can tell you on a personal level, what's frustrating for me is I miss a lot of calls. My percentage tanks, I, I miss, you know, all these seal alarms and these, you know, AFAs and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, man, if I had a duty crew, and I wasn't, uh, if I wasn't beat up to the ones I could, the ones yeah. I missed. Now, listen, I missed the ones on my duty crew. I'm not the firehouse. That's my own fault. Right, right. Um, so that's my personal frustration. No, with I, it, I you think know. that, you know, again, uh, you look up the definition of volunteer. You volunteer to follow rules. And our rules are going to change. Effective, uh, you know, uh, September 1st, we're going to duty crew. Now, duty crew means it's four or five and quarters you're taking the first rig out. We're only going to set off a tone for them, a uh, car fire, uh, dumpster fire, automatic alarm, you know, whatever you're going to call it, okay, whatever right. you decide. But on a building fire, all pages are going to go off. The rest of you are still going to come to the firehouse. We'll get the other rigs out. But imagine if four or five towns near each other all did a duty crew. Yeah. So you're getting three or four rigs out at one like, shot. And then five, six minutes later, the rest of the infantry shows up. It, it, it's a, I'm talking about operating like a career department as a volunteer. It's, it's so simple, and it doesn't yeah. cost a whole lot. of. It costs nothing, actually. So you... You've had this uh, amazing career, you know, as, as, a, as a firefighter and as, as a chief officer. Um, tell me how the whole close call thing came about for you. The firefighter close call? Yeah. So it started in the 70s when I, um, from the period of around 1977 to 1982 in Long Island, we lost a lot of firefighters in the line of duty. We lost two firefighters at Beth Page at a pool supply place. Uh, we lost some firefighters at Valley Stream. We lost a firefighter at Wontaw. Uh, and as a relatively young firefighter at the time, I'm thinking, everyone seems to be taking this as if it's routine. Like, oh, no, it's terrible. I mean, we cried and mourned and we, you know, did the sea of blue, but we weren't really doing much to, like, let's look at that. And there was no NIOSH back then. And right, stuff, right. right. So. Um, These guys you knew, Chief? These guys you personally knew? No, but okay. we're getting there. <laughs> okay. 
So a guy I did know in a neighboring town uh, in um, uh, Garden City Park, uh, they were fighting a van fire and a, a propane tank exploded and killed him instantly. Ugh. And that really was the final, like, wow, man. And yeah. Then, like, and I know this makes people crazy, but I'm thinking, you know, and I've done this many times, we'll do an aggressive interior attack on a van, right? What, what are you doing? I'm thinking, you know, how about, like, uh, well, here's an example. Um, so when I was going to school down in Florida, I was in the fire department down there in Broward County. We're responding to a vehicle fire right by the Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport. So, but we were the county and they were the city, and the city covered just the airport there, right? Sure. So we're on our, you know, six of us at the fire, so all six of us got on the rig. We just held on wherever you could. You know, there's only three <laughs> seats on the rig. We're racing down the street. We can see smoke, so we're driving faster and turning on more sirens. and Yeah, let's defrost, get everything working. Defrosters, wipers, <laughs> everything. We just turn everything on. So we're, we turn the corner, and here's this thing. This vehicle's just rocking away. And out of the corner, here comes the uh, crash fire rescue truck. No lights. No, now we're going, Wah! we're screaming. We're yeah. bending the queue. Right? I like and it. Here comes the crash uh, truck. He's like, just one guy. I was like, dun, 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 dun. And we're like, ah! <laughs> You know, and we pull up, we put our pack. We probably did not put a pack on back then. But we grab a line, and we look over, and the driver to rig by himself, he throws a cigarette butt out the window. He takes a little drink of Coke, and he throws one button, and boom, boom covers the car with foam. The next thing you hear is his backup alarm, and he's giving us the finger as we're leaving. He said, I solved your whole problem for you. I solved your whole problem. Why are you even here? Go home, right? <laughs> My point is, we had guys get their legs busted open because the uh, pist the, uh, um, uh, what am I thinking? Um, on your car hood. Oh, the struts? The, the, strut, the, struts right, yeah. the strut, or the bumper struts, or right, any right. of those. Uh, for what? You know, I mean, those things explode. It's, yeah. Well, we want to be aggressive. And t Shut up. It's, it's a car fire. I mean, odds are the owner wants you to let it burn so you get a new car, right? Unless somebody's in there like grandma <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah, God forbid. But, right, exactly. But the point is, I started thinking what's necessary and what's not. And, and look, I've got as many melted bent helmets and b melted borks as anybody does, uh, you know, for the for the career I've had. Most sure. suburban, right? Right, right. Um, that whole risk versus reward. So I love going to fires. I love crawling down a hole. I love doing all that. Yeah, me but too. But sometimes it's like, come on, it's a stupid car fire. Just put it off and go home. Because otherwise we're playing. And that's what happens. We're playing. And we see it still a lot. I mean, I'm, I do work as an SME for NIOSH. And many of the investigations I'm involved with, they were just freelancing and playing. This company didn't want to be the RIT team, so they just went in and did what they wanted and played and you know, and get, and then the guy dies. Oh my God, it's terrible. Let's sell yeah. shirts and let's raise money. And well, how about you just have a little discipline on the fire ground? And it really does come down to that. You know, slow down and discipline, and then with that recipe, add some good training, good leadership. And, and uh, look, there's going to be times we're going to get killed. Yeah, it's a risky job, but sure. some of the risk is stupid. And uh, you know, I felt that way years ago. Uh, and I still feel that way, and even more so now as I've seen so much more. And, you know, i got a kid who's on a job, and I, I, I look out for him, obviously, and, and the people he works with and all. So it's kind of a big deal, and it's very personal. What, what is it like for, for you to see your, your son grow to be a firefighter and follow your footsteps? What's that like for you? So the word is discipline. I have to, rec I have to maintain strong discipline to stay out of his shit on a regular basis because I can't. I'm trying not living my life through him, but right, right. I'm very, very proud of him. It's... Uh, that's a, just a quick story, but he was going to Ohio State for, you know, accounting or whatever, and one day he comes home and says, you know what, I can't find anything I want to be when I grow up. I said, what do you want to do? He says, well, maybe be a firefighter. I said, really? So, so that means, to me, that means you never pushed him to do any of this. No, no. That's very clear to me. No, no. Yeah, I respect that. I mean, as a kid, um, right around the time to when he discovered girls, up until then, he, I mean, he had his own siren button on the side. He ride in the front seat of my cheese car. I mean, he was oh, so he it. was into it then, like. and that. But he grew up discovering girls and blah blah blah. Yeah. You know, things change, right? Sure. And then one day, though, he comes back, and it must have been in the back of his mind. So he's uh, so the seed uh, was there, it just wasn't wasn't yeah, yeah. fertilized so yet. He went to the University <laughs> of Maryland, was uh, lived in the College Park Firehouse, uh, and uh, graduated. Went to paramedic school because he's a smart firefighter. 
without the EMS side, you're not going anywhere fast. Not it's nowadays. Just, no, you can't. You got to understand nowadays. that. And uh, then he got hired as a career firefighter in Prince George's County. And he's oh, now a lieutenant. PG County, huh? He's a lieutenant. That's no joke out there. <laughs> They're the real deal out there. That's no joke. Well, and, and you know what? Like we were just talking about, it depends who's working. depends yeah. on the crew. Yep. Uh, they do work. Um, and uh, well, for the work. most part, they've got some phenomenal career and volunteer folks. And you, you read stories and stuff, but you know what? Day to day, they get along and it works, and it's a good system. And uh, they're, deliver they're delivering a heck of a product to the citizens in Prince George's that's affordable with some amazing staffing, amazing response, and in many cases, very well trained. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So that, that firefighter close call, that's... Oh, yeah. So let's go to that. So that's... Sorry about that. No, no, no. I so, like yeah. it. I like it off topic because like, <laughs> like I say all the time, my shows, and at least you can prove it now, um, you would never lie. Uh, there is no script, right? And that's what oh, I love. No, no, no. That's what I love if about this was, show. I wouldn't be here. Yeah, I appreciate I that. that. <laughs> so back to what I was saying. I was impacted by a lot of this. So sure. it was always in the back of my mind. I always, uh, uh, I, I became a chief in 82 uh, I was assistant chief, and I was very strong about uh, safety, survival, and I had some of the most aggressive firefighters in the world. I'm not, I'm not saying we you know, stood outside with thumbs in our ears and stuff. That was yeah, never yeah. the case. Sure. But it was, let's not be stupid. And there's uh, solve it through training and discipline, and that's what we did, and, and a very strong command structure. And I've always, uh, uh, wherever I've worked, uh, always maintained a very strong uh, command and control presence, learned that from Vinnie Dunn and many of the greats. That oh, made, yeah, yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, the coach has got to be strong. And the coach has got to be qualified, okay? And that's a big deal, too. we got a lot of bosses that probably should go back to doing what they were doing before. They haven't been to school in years. Yeah. They don't attend, you know, FDIC. They don't study. But yet they jump in a car and take command. There's some, some paper bosses out there. And, yep. and, you know, and they, they don't train with the troops. And then suddenly, I mean, what kind of football coach doesn't do attend practice, right? They're engaged. Well, the Chiefs need to be engaged, too. I'm, saying, I'm not saying pulling hoses. I haven't pulled a hose or worked a herstool in 20-something years. But I'll tell you what, I'm a damn good command officer because my department requires me to go to school, go to training constantly. Yeah. And uh, I think it's great. If, if you're in the game, you got to keep practicing. And as one of those guys on the inside crawling down that hallway right now, even at my age, at 43 years old, I'm crawling those hallways. I I, I want to make sure that, that that guy at the command center knows what the hell he's doing. Yeah, because because I can't see conditions exactly from the outside. Exactly right. And there's got to be that relationship. Right. And if the bosses are not participating now. So you're going to go out and do an engine company drill. So what, what am I going to do if I'm the chief? Well, you go out there and you command that. Right. Okay, engine seven, stretch out from here, lay a line, bring it up to you, you know, whatever you want to do. But do your job. Do what you do and practice that. And we we have a very strict system. Uh, we go to our command training center. We've got to have an, a certain amount of hours. We take online courses. Uh, they'll put up on the screen where they'll quiz us live. You know, like you'll be on a microphone. and like, I'm, all right, you got two people trapped. Here's why engine one responded to you two. You're the chief. What are you going to do? That's good. Actually, I'd rather go to a fire than do that it's actually yeah, very it's stressful nerve -wracking. it is stressful it is yeah, <laughs> because i don't know what they're going to pull off right? because you're being monitored on everything absolutely. you say absolutely but mm -hmm. i love it and and me look, too i study hard I'm, I'm not overly confident uh i just took a uh, research in, in my uh, certifications as a fire commander and uh, you push the button to see how you did i'm like yes you passed the first time thank <laughs> god i have never been good at tests oh my god no, no me neither right and that that's it so yeah so anyway so um, the Internet was invented. That's kind of where we need to go now. The Internet was invented. Because now before the Internet, I would cut and paste safety bulletins from old WNYF magazines, That's old awesome. fire engineering's, and I would run them on a printer, you know, on a copy machine. Right. You know, unless one of the firefighters was sitting on it with their ass or something. <laughs> as soon as they were done doing that. Yeah, you know, can you get off here? I need this. Exactly, I need to actually use this for what it's for. Oh, sorry. And <laughs> yeah, take your other stuff with you. Right. So... <clears throat> So, I w oh, I did that for years. I would print them out. I'd cut and paste and right. make bulletins and put them up in the firehouse and the bathrooms and everywhere And because I was very much into this. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I forced myself on others. If you're going to be here and you're going to wear our colors and all that shit, then either be in or out, right? right. And I've, I've dealt with the out people a lot in my career. Uh, they're kind of here, but, you know, really not into the game. So I've created an environment over many years uh, that, where I'm involved, either you're in or you don't want to be there. Yes, 
Oh, God, yes. And our organization is like yeah. that. I can tell you my boss, our ops chief, and, and the other chiefs, either you're in or you're out. Right. Uh, you, you can't kind of be halfway, right? So um, so the Internet was invented. and uh, Boy, I did was, that change things. Well, everything, right? Good, bad, the whole thing. So I was on AOL. And uh, I didn't even know much about. I was like a year or two late to the internet because you know, <laughs> you've got mail. <laughs> this thing isn't gonna work, you know. Right? Yeah. The internet's stupid. Right? <laughs> so um, I got the uh, I got an account, and um, whenever we had a good incident, and we didn't have Google back then, or anytime I saw something on the news, I'd share that with people. Now a friend of mine, Jack McElfish. Jack was the chief in Richmond, Virginia, and in Clayton County, Georgia. And Jack used to do something similar to what I did, but he would put all those things in envelopes. He'd see interesting articles. He'd have his staff photocopy it. And there was like a dozen of us who would get these big, as some people call it, big vanilla envelopes. Oh, yeah. It's actually vanilla. a vanilla envelope. Vanilla, yeah. <laughs> you get these big vanilla envelopes. I open up. It's just articles and this and that. Yeah. So I kind of got that from him, right? And I said, well, yeah, I got the AOL thing. So, excuse me, so as I got to know friends and stuff, so I'd see something on the news, say, hey, firefighter struck in New Jersey, uh, roof collapse kills firefighter in London, you know, whatever it was. And over time, I just kept adding people, hey, can you add me your name, add me your name, you know, all that stuff. So, Boy, that grow, huh? So it did. It's crazy. So at the time, um, one of my firefighters, volunteers, uh, was uh, involved at AOL. So he got me a business account. Cool. Which means you can have as many recipients as you want. Right, you weren't limited. Exactly. So then, as it started to grow, I put parentheses around the names, which is BCC, blind card, blind, you know. Yeah, blind, blind, uh, blind carbon, carbon copy. Blind carbon copy, yeah. carbon, which is a yeah. black piece of paper. Yeah. So, um, and I just kept sending stuff out, sending stuff out, and it's three, four hundred thousand. You know, we don't give wow. the number out. Yeah. Holy moly. It's all over the world. Yeah, so we... we I mean, tell me what that's like personally for you to be to see where you came from, your humble beginnings, right? From what it's what it's personal. What's personal about it is to remember that you're just another jerk, you're just another firefighter, uh, and you got uh, with a little bit of work, a little bit of luck, you got you got some. But now you got to understand once you have that, you can't abuse it, and we're very careful with that. Um, I write ninety nine point nine 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 of every secret list that goes out. Once in a while, I'll be unavailable, and, and Brian or, or one of our guys uh, will cover it. He'll write it up, and but you know, um, get the word out. But I write every. Pretty does, much does it? Way. Can I ask you, Chief? Yeah. Does it take an emotional toll on you at some point? At some times, I don't reading? think so. No, I don't think so. Um, no, that's not what makes me. Or does it drive you more? To I think it drives me more. I, yeah. I, I equate it to throwing mud. I'm going to keep throwing to see what sticks. Yeah. And uh, and then so anyway, so Gordon Graham who who. Uh, Presented with me here this uh, this year again. Gordon is, I would say, unequivocally the foremost expert in risk management and public safety. Yeah, I've seen I've seen his things online. Are amazing. Runs, runs yeah. a company called Lexapol, and we'll talk about that if you want. Sure. But Gordon, <clears throat> uh, we were teaching together on the road. Uh, he was CHP, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, he retired as a commander of the California Air Patrol. So he came up to me. We were teaching for a group back then called Command School. And myself, Bruno, Dennis Rubin, Carl Holmes, uh, others. Uh, and this guy, Glenn Usden, who was a chief in Pennsylvania, he put this school together, and it would be like, take this school on the road. Okay. So it would like, bring like a little mini FDIC to your town. And he did cool. all the work. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So Gordon and I got to be really good friends, and he said to me, you know, one day, you, you keep saying this, oh, the secret list out. So why is it called the secret list? So um, when I... Um, uh, started doing the BCCs, nobody could see who else is on there. Oh, right, right. So people would ask me, oh, it's a secret, I can't tell you, I'm just screwing with them. But, uh, so then <laughs> one day I wrote, you know, uh, collapse, uh, injures two firefighters, the secret list, and that's where it came. It doesn't oh, mean anything. No that's one. neat. Yeah. So that's, that's so neat, man. That's kind of the story behind that. That's cool. So he said, you know, well, uh, I said, I really didn't have time at the time, and I was uh, money was very, very tight back then. And uh, he said, well, when you find the money and the time, uh, forget the money, I'll fund this. But you need the time. So about six months later, I said, yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, it is. So uh, he funded and still to this day pays every penny of firefighter close calls. That's amazing. Yeah, so we just celebrated our 20th year with um, the secret list. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that and, stuff. Man. It gives me goosebumps. I love it. Yeah, so and I've done a couple of books and, and we sold some T-shirts and 
uh, all the T-shirts uh, we sold for uh, for the anniversary, and we only did it for a one-year window. Uh, we raised thousands of dollars for the um, Firefighter Cancer Support Network. Wow, that's great. And the, um, the it was two charities and the Ray Pfeiffer Foundation. Ray was a very good friend of mine, uh, and uh, he died from 9-11 disease. And um, Ray actually had to chase politicians down in the Washington, at the, at the United States Capitol in his wheelchair to get them to sign on uh, for the Zadroga bill and some of that stuff to continue on. And uh, so... Um, when Ray died, they started a foundation. So we gave half the money to his foundation and half the money of the shirts to the um, Firefighter Cancer Support Network. And our books, same thing, uh, pass it on one, pass it on two. Uh, every penny goes to charity, and we've raised tens of thousands of dollars. Wow, that's awesome. With those. That's we'll that be, giving back. That's we'll, great. Yeah, exactly. you got to do that. Yeah. I mean, the job. Yeah. Um, next year, this time, we'll have uh, pass it on three out. Oh, that's great. A couple other books. That's exciting. Going. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, that's Firefighter Close Calls. That's, that's Secret neat. List. And I've got uh, about uh, eight or nine uh, folks who are volunteers to help keep it running. Uh, nobody gets any money. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're going to do this kind of stuff to make money, then, you know what, just go do something else. Because the, 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 the recognition, the rewards, the, the wonderful things come when you work, when you're focused on something much more than just putting a dollar in your pocket. You know, for me, Chief, being able to sit like this right now with you and listen to these stories and, and getting the, God, the experience and knowledge from a guy like you, a legend in the fire service, that's my reward. Yeah, Honestly, yeah, you know, it, yeah. it, for and me, I've that's... I've been through the same thing. Yeah. I got to ride with Frank Brannigan in a car for four hours years ago. I picked him up. We went to the FDY <laughs> cool. Fire Bell Club meeting. And if you know anything about Frank Brannigan, he'd talk endlessly. And I tell people, I picked him up in Maryland, and he put a period at the end of the sentence in the Bronx <laughs> when we got to this uh, event we were going to. But uh, Vinnie Dunn and, and, and John Norman and, 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 I mean, there's just Don Mano, Jack Mackler, the, the names are. And I did it by going to FDIC, by going to these, and, and going to the classes and introducing myself and learning. And, and, and you'll find in almost 95% of the case, the instructor is just like you. They're yeah. into it. And, and, well, let me tell you, if I can, mm -hmm. FDIC, for me, um, I was a little intimidated coming in, I guess, because, you know, when I saw some of the names of the instructors, I'm like, oh, man, these guys, they, these are and real deal. My dad would tell you, they sit and shit the same way you yep, and I They do. put their <laughs> pants on and say, I've heard all this stuff. You know, they put their yeah. pants on just like you. But, you know, when I get there, I'm thinking, they're not going to have time for us, man. They're just going to go through the thing. And it was the direct That's opposite. That's not true. The direct opposite. Not only did those guys spend time with us, but they, they kept saying things like, look, I'm just like you, man. I'm a fireman. We're brothers. Absolutely. Whatever you need, I'm here. The, the amount of personal attention that we got, Captain Morris, FDNY, right? Retired Captain Morris. Legendary. Right? Now He'll this sit and have a cup of coffee with you in a heartbeat. I believe it because I, I sat with him. And here's a man that I used to watch in VHS tapes, okay? And then when the YouTube, of course, came out, I'm watching my YouTube. I'm like, oh, man, look at this guy. Look at this sure. guy. Now he's he's using a rope rig on me. Right. I'm his dummy. Yeah. Here I am standing in this elevator hallway. And he's wearing a buff T-shirt and blue jeans. <laughs> no, he's wearing an old school FDNY or job, job shirt. Job shirt, right. That's what I'm saying. Right? Yeah. So I'm standing there, and and, and he's putting a rope on me. I got to be honest with you. I felt like a little kid. I felt like five year old little kid seeing right? like Superman. You know, here he is rigging me up on this thing. I'm yeah. like, Jesus Christ. Look at this man. He's the reason many of these people are successful because, you know, uh, the shit will float to the bottom and the good will come to the top. And, and uh, there's a couple knuckleheads out there that are portraying to do this. And, but the most part, these are very, very good people. Uh, you know, you walk down the hall and see John Salk, he'll sit and talk to you for 20 minutes. If you, you know, if That's amazing, time. yeah. And, uh, what an honor that'd be. And not yeah. just FDNY guys, anybody. Yeah, you know, yeah. Anthony out in California or uh, uh, people down in Florida, whatever. They're just regular people. And if you go up to talk to them and they're not then maybe that's not who you want to be learning from. Yeah. If they don't have time to talk to you. you know, again, you're going to go meet somebody for dinner. That, that's different. But right, 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 these right. are good people. Right. Actually, uh, you know, you were, showing me an, you were showing me an app before. Oh, yeah. yeah. So if you could talk about that, that would be awesome. Because yeah. I think this is so important for, um, you know, for these firefighters to see this stuff. This is very cool. So this is something from a company called Cortico. C-O-R-D-I-C-O. -O. Okay. And... It, it, it's, you know, like all the other apps on here, um, 
but it's focused on the behavioral health of firefighters. And now think about your average firefighter today, the younger ones, okay? And this is, you know, people say, oh, they're different. You know what they, of course, and you were too. Sure. They're no worse, they're no better. Oh, they're only, stop. You can guide these folks in any direction you need to go. Trust me, we got all the millennials. I got kids whose thumbs are super strong for playing <laughs> video games. And you never want to thumb wrestle those still kids. Still good firefighters, right? So, um, but in many cases, their world is in this. Okay, it's in the computer. That that's where they were raised. My grandson, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Henry's going to be 11 years old. He runs circles around me on this. Stuff. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yep. I mean, so that's their world. So we need to accept that, right? And let me just grab a quick drink. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to do the same thing. So, yeah. So while you're having your drink, we uh, the Omni Hotel is where we're at. Omni Hotel and Resorts. They were nice enough to give us this room. Free of charge. It was, it was a big deal. Good stuff. And yes. I see you've got your cot set up in the back. <laughs> it's nice. <clears throat> so um, a couple folks got together with this uh, guy named Dr. David Black. And it's just an ingenious idea, but it's an app that's totally confidential because there's no sign-in. You just you purchase it for your organization. Then your chief sends out an email, hey, we just got this. Here's your passcode or whatever, so you can gain it. Only you can get it, right? And your spouse is too, which I think is kind of a cool idea. Really? Uh, so they also can maybe work with you on stuff. It's your choice. You don't okay. want your spouse or partner or whatever, then right. you don't, right? <clears throat> so here's the app, and, and you just push the button, and immediately it comes up with a menu of wellness toolkits, self-assessments, therapist finder, cancer aware, all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> and if you go to, I think you just Google Cortico, I think maybe it is cortico.com, C-O-R-D-I-C-O. Yeah, I'll put the link up on that. Okay, cool, yeah. Yeah. And so there's like a wellness toolkit. So uh, somebody said, uh, you know, you, you got an anger management problem, you know. Okay, so you click that, and it kind of walks you through the process. Gives you an overview, what's clinical anger, and you can do a self-assessment, walk through this, click here if you would like to complete the – and this is by yourself, so you don't have to drive two days to go or, you know, 20 miles to go see a therapist. You don't have to talk to your boss if you don't want to. This is just you and you. Right. Okay, kind of a little self-exploration. Um, they have, uh, you know, catching anger early. I mean, there's just tons of stuff. You need to go to the website and check it out. Um, but, you know, let's say, you know, I, I seem to be at the bar a lot more than I used to be, right? Or someone says, hey, man, I think you got a drinking problem. What are you drinking so much yeah. for? And again... So here's all sorts of information and articles, but I think probably my favorite part of this is the self-assessments. So we're talking about drinking, alcohol, do you have a drinking problem? And you click on it, it walks you through, and at the end it scores you based upon nationally accepted standards. Yeah, you do, you may need to go see a therapist. Okay, all right, well maybe I'll, maybe I'll get the courage to do that through our EAP program. Well, you can actually go in the app, you touch Therapist Finder, and it's pre-downloaded by your organization of what your accepted therapists are. And you can just touch it, and it, there's one particular, this is a department out in California, tells you all about who the therapist is. And not only does that, it gives you the doctor's photograph. Their history, the photo. So let's say you're a woman and you'd rather talk to a woman. Right, right. There it is. You're a guy. You'd rather talk to a guy. You're African American. Whatever. Right, right. It's all on there, right? Something you're more... This is all about you controlling your environment and especially when we're dealing with a situation where the environment is starting to control us. Correct. So this gives you control back, right? Right. But what's cool, call us, directions, email her or her website. It's all there. So... And it's 100% confidential. It's, because it's an app. You're right. not going and signing in. Right. So it's not getting so, your information. No. Now, um, what the organization can get is this, and it's helpful, an overview. Okay. In six months, how many people are using it? What's in, you know, but that's between, you know, whether it's the union local, the volunteers. You know, we don't want that. We just want to be able to use that. Or why not? Maybe we can do things in the organization to improve. Right? Maybe they can do a round top and see that maybe more folks are having the same issues exactly right yeah and yep. you can work with those folks yeah. so i think that's probably one of the absolute coolest innovations that i've seen this year that's uh, really good and, man and it and it you know what it, it it's 
It's addressing a big deal. Yeah. Uh, we, we work with an organization called Nextrong, and there are firefighters out of Georgia yes. that are doing just, they're trying to put more focus on PTSD awareness. Well, hook and me like, up with those guys, and I, I'll hook them up with these folks. I definitely will. I definitely will. I mean, he, he's a great he's a great dude. They're, they're here. Um, they're definitely going to be here, but I'll, I'll be sure to tell them about or this Or introduce app. me to them this week, and we'll have a conversation. I certainly will. I'd somebody, be honored to do that. Yeah, some of the boys and girls with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and... Let me just share a little philosophy because Please. I'm from the older generation. I'll be 64 this year, so I'm not too old, but you know I'm not a kid anymore. And I struggle trying to get why certain things bother people. I've been on some horrible calls, like most of us. I was on a call where, well, for an example, I was on a call where the father stabbed three children, killed them, killed his wife, and some firefighters actually retired off of that. I'm like, why would they have to retire? This is a couple years ago. Why would that bother? This is the job, you know. And I was never one of those suck it up, but I was somewhere in between where I should be and that, okay? And I kind of came up with my own little, and I have my own little uh, correlations in life and thoughts, and some would probably force a retirement if they did an evaluation on me, but I just, I'm trying to understand why does this call bother you but it doesn't bother me, and it's this simple in my mind. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I've never been to therapy school. I've been to therapy, but never therapy school, right? And here's my my observation: is that if you and I go out to dinner and you order fish, I'm going to puke. I hate fish. <laughs> I don't care how much tartar sauce, lettuce, tomato, and all this crap. Ain't going in here. All right. But you love fish. All right. Doesn't make you right. Doesn't make you wrong. It just makes it you're different. Right. So after we have your disgusting fish meal and I get a steak, right, and we go to a movie together, we meet our spouses or whatever, and go, let's go watch a movie. And I'm on the floor dying of laughter because this is the funniest damn movie, and you're looking at me like I'm out of my mind. Right. It doesn't make it bad or good. It means that I f see things differently than you. And I've been trying to get fire officers to understand it the same way. The person who can best save our lives in this business is our company officer, whether it's tactical, emotional, operational, whatever, company officer. And that is where the rubber meets the road, and until chiefs all get that, we ain't going to succeed. So I've been trying to preach, whether it's teaching or writing or whatever, to get company officers to understand it's that simple. Joey's crying after that run because to him that's sad. Maybe something in his life happened like that. Maybe it's just the way he's made. Whatever, you know, that's beyond me. That's God stuff, right? And but the fact that he's crying is a problem, right? And not we should break his chops about it or something. Right. You know what? You're laughing because the movie's funny. I think it's stupid. You're eating fish because it's delicious. I'm puking in the bathroom, right? It's that simple, just for you to apply. Now apply that, and all you have to do is remember the the movie, the funny, the fish, the steak. And then because you see that and realize that difference, you then now help them take action, whether it's through a cortico system, whether it's through EAP, whether it's through uh, the IFF has an amazing program, behavioral health. But you got the officers that gatekeeper, and you got to accept that people are different. Right. And you can't expect everybody to be the same. Maybe, my, maybe the generation before me was tougher because most of them went to war. I don't know. World War Two, I had guys. World War Two, I had guys from Vietnam. Okay, the last couple of years we have a volunteer army, so we don't have as many veterans and stuff. So maybe that's I don't know, but I do know that I'm in a firehouse. I'm responsible for people, and that means if they're happy or sad, I got to try and do something. It's not it's not snowflake stuff or any of that crap. This you know we do go to bad stuff, and people do respond to it differently. When I when I go to work and I got my my crew behind me and I sit in that seat, I always say this: when I get in that front seat, I look at my chauffeur. Right? And then I look back at my crew. I want to make sure that those guys all know that I have them. No matter what, I have them. I need to know everything they're doing. And we joke. Uh, anybody who knows me knows I love to joke around and have fun at the firehouse. I absolutely love it. But when we get in the rig. Don't waterboard and don't put things no, I don't in do their that. orifices. I don't stuff. do that. Yeah, no. Do that. But when we, get, when we get, you know, outside of the firehouse and we, we get in that rig, it's game time. And, so you and I probably that. don't need, they pro you probably don't need to turn around because. If you're that kind of officer, they already know that. Yeah. They worry about it. He's got us. I'm so lucky because the guys I work with are just freaking amazing. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I never have to worry about if they're going to be there because they're, they're going to be there. 
And and I think, like you just said, and I agree 100%, I think the, the company officers, especially now, need to know every one of their members intimately. You they need to know these up. guys. You yeah. size them up. So, yeah. so there has to be a standard. They have to all be able to throw ladders. They have to all be able to stretch lines. Okay, but understand that Mike's a little sensitive on this kind of thing. And if your response is, well, screw them, then you're failing. It's not going to work. Because that might have worked 20 years ago. But it, this is all you're getting is these people. There's no other, like, we're not recruiting some other generation from years ago. This is the kids today. You may like it, you may not. You know what? Nobody cares. Right. Nobody cares if you like it. Yeah. We're asking you to do a job, and that means take care of your people. And that means you got to get a little education. you got to uh, learn a little bit. And perhaps even through understanding the differences in steak and fish or whatever you can use to help you apply. The fact is that, you know, Tina's not acting the way she normally does today. Something's up. Tina, you all right? They're always going to say I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. So you keep an eye on that. And are you sure? Well, you got a minute? And boom, now you... Now the conversation that's starts. Happen. That's not going to happen unless there's a relationship or respect and trust. And an officer that has that empathy and understands, you know what? And, and you're not going to gossip about it. Big deal, right? We're great at gossip. Yeah, we are. Tina, trust you, buddy. That's that's like a vault, like on Seinfeld. It's in the vault. In the vault. Whatever. It's in the but vault. But it has to be in that's the vault. That's my favorite show. <laughs> I love that you use that reference. I like. So before I let you off the hot seat, I know you got to go, Chief. Um, what what's the advice you're giving to this brand new firefighter, brand new firefighter walking through that door, male or female? They're walking in that door and they're like, "Hey, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a firefighter. I want to do this job." What advice do you have for them? So I'll give you three three levels. So we'll do the firefighter, we'll do the officer, and do the chief. Okay. <clears throat> So to the new firefighters, you have two ears and one mouth. Shut your mouth. Lots of listening. Lots of conditioning. Uh, you know, uh, understand this is a commitment. And this is volunteer, career, whatever. Right. And understand this is an either you're in or you're out kind of thing. A little bit soprano-ish, right? Okay? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you got to be into what we do. You got to uh, understand the team sport concept of backing each other up. Um, and, you know, go read, pass it on. The whole book, I'm, I'm not pitching the book because, again, we don't make any money, but the book is packed with the question you just asked because that's what I asked my co-authors, is tell people what you think. But it's really to lots of, lots of listen. Uh, the new probie walking in the first day, um, uh, leave your phone in the car. <laughs> tell whoever needs to call you yeah. to call the firehouse and it better involve a funeral or a hospital. Otherwise, you have no time. Yeah. Uh, you have no time to sit around. Uh, I better hear the compartment door slamming. I, I love hear it. You I asking it. about questions about equipment and stuff. Yeah. And you better be the first one to the firehouse. You better be the first one in the kitchen to help. You better not be in the TV room for six months to a year. You don't have time. This is I mean, at any one moment that wheel spins on what the next calls were going to be, and it's the same odds as on, on you know wheel of fortune, whatever. The odds of you hitting the big number is, is you know, few and far between. But when that big number does hit... Are you ready? Somebody's on yeah. top of the water tower and they're threatening to jump. How good are you with your knots now and with your, with your Stokes basket and your climbing? Okay, when's the last time you threw a 40-foot uh, uh, ground ladder in the back of a three-story house? It's those odd incidents, which really are routine incidents, right? Um that you got to be prepared for. And this is serious stuff. Yeah. Uh, would you want you responding to your incident? Is, is that's probably. a great question. So, yeah. So that's a great self-evaluation. So that's the probie. Okay. That's, uh, and, and understand also you're in the business to serve. And, and, you know, if you think getting up three o'clock in the morning because Mr. Jones crapped her pants and Mr. Jones died years ago and there's nobody else to get her back in the bed is a bullshit call, then don't, don't be here because we're going to be doing a lot of that. And if you hate visiting the kids at school for public education, you don't like taking blood pressures, you don't like riding the ambulance, we need to rethink about it because, you know, we ride the ambulance a lot here. Uh, and it's just part of this job. Yeah, you know? and I'll be, I'll be honest with you, Chief. I'm, gu I'm guilty of that. I, I, I'm an EMT. Um, I just, over the years, I've, I've come to not want to be in the ambulance. Do you understand uh, the greatest impact you're going to have is not at somebody's house fire. It's going to be... It's in the back of that rig, I know. An ambulance. You, you, know? I, you agree. And, it, and look, we, we have a nationwide abuse problem with the with the ambulance, with the EMS. You know, Can I tell ambulance. you, that's a frustrating part for me. Sure. You, you show up in the ambo, because I've, I've been EMT a long time, 27 years, and you get in the back and uh, you pull up to a job and they got literally a suitcase. Literally a suitcase. 
waiting for you at the door. It's a social issue that needs to be solved by people more yeah. important than us. They need an Uber or a Lyft. They don't need... And some communities are doing that. Uh, you'll dial 911 and they'll screen the call with a nurse practitioner or somebody. Wow. And she'll say... That's you've awesome. A, you've had a cold for a week, yeah? You're just coughing? Yeah, okay. So we're going to send an Uber to your house, give them a voucher number 27312, and it takes care of it. Oh, they need to come to Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> well... The OMS, EMS system in Jersey is worthy of a whole, a whole other show where paramedics can't even be in the fire department, right? It's a, right, right. That whole, uh, that whole system. Deregulation or whatever it's called. Crazy. So that, that's the probie, all right? <coughs> Understand what this job is. And, and, and yeah, you're going to go to some fires, but you're going to be doing a lot of other stuff too. If you're not into training, if you're coming here to sleep, this is not the place for you. Yeah. And set the tone even uh, – so next, company officer. I'm jumping out of myself. Next is for you, as the company officer, your primary mission is to take care of those people. Right? Mm -hmm. I agree. And uh, make sure they don't get themselves hurt. Don't do, don't do stupid stuff. And understand you're not their friend. And this is the most difficult, difficult, difficult transition we have. If you happen to go socially once a year or twice a year, that's fine. But you can t if you socialize on a regular basis, you're asking for trouble. Uh, you've got to be able to have that distance. And I know everybody listening is going to disagree with me. But for everybody who disagrees, I'll give you a case study where it backfired. Um, doesn't mean you're a jerk. It doesn't mean you didn't participate in the softball league. But you're still the lieutenant. You're still the captain. And you get too close sometimes, it makes it where we're not able to make good decisions. And that's what you're being paid for, or even if you're a volunteer. I mean, basically, when you go to the firehouse, it's a behavioral rental agreement. Lute are you a captain, lieutenant? Or? I'm acting as a captain right now. Okay, so we call captain. supervisors. Okay, so as captain... Um, I agree to pay you every two weeks for a certain type of behavior. Some of it's not your option. You're going to behave the way I tell you to, okay? Right. And you need to, if you see a problem, I uh, deal with that. No, I'm paying you. You have no problem taking a paycheck every two weeks. Then why aren't you doing what's expected, right? Right. And, and again, we want to be friends. And it, it's kind of a little bit of a, it's, it's almost like a funny joke that we are very personal, personable as firefighters. So then when you promote up, you, you got to sort of put that a little bit on the side and you be a boss. And it's very difficult. I know I had difficulty. Very hard transition. It is. Especially when you're friends with these guys and then you come up with them and then now you're and the you boss. And you broke every rule with them too. Course, yeah, And now you got to tell them not to do that. Oh, right. I, well, then you're a hypocrite. One. Exactly. So it's challenging. And so what's the solution? One, you need to be fully prepared to make that transition. But the organization needs to have a system in place to test, to see even though you're a great firefighter, a great driver, Let's see if you have the aptitude to be a good officer because it is different. Not a great firefighter. Uh, a good officer always should have been a good firefighter. I agree. But not every good firefighter is able to be an officer because there's some of the personality involved in that, uh, who you are, you know, the behavior. And then, um, and, and, and again, as the company officer, you're the bottom line. Uh, you know, you got a driver who's not wearing a seatbelt. Uh, it's go time. Now, are you going to do something about it or not? If you don't, now you've given permission for everybody to not wear a seatbelt. You have a crew that doesn't want to train. Now you're saying, oh, we just don't train around here. Uh, you have a firefighter that didn't, uh, uh, you know, they're assigned to clean the ladders every Thursday. And they didn't do it. Well, now nobody has to clean it, you know. So you got to set the tone. And, again, you're being paid to do that. That's your job. Or if you're a volunteer, you're accepting that privilege as your pay. Pride is our pay, right? Absolutely. So yeah. that is what you are expected to do. Or don't do it. It's okay. Yeah. Go back to riding the bucket, the jump seat, whatever. Yeah. But if it's if you can't do this job, I mean, why, why are you doing it? And yeah. then, then the next tough transition is is going from the firehouse to become a chief officer. And, uh, I, I mean, we could spend all day talking just on this subject. But probably the biggest challenge you're going to have is when you're a chief is to keep your hands out of shit. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I know exactly Step what you're talking about. Step back. Yeah. Trust them. Now, some people have drilling. a hard time with that. Oh, every day. Yep. Tough, right? Uh, step back. Let them do their job. Mentor. Say, hey, you know what? You did a really good job in that last room. Well, let me give you some suggestions here. But that, of course, that only works if the supervisor's qualified to give you that information, right? Which is another challenge. Yeah. But stay back, chief. Uh, Distant yourself. I love this. Let the captain be the captain. Yeah. Let the lieutenant be lieutenant. But be there uh, as the lifeguard. Right. Okay. Now, an incident, you're in command, but the system's got to work, right? But if if, if it's a day-to-day uh, -day problem or if it's a, 
uh, an issue or, or if it's a car fire. You want to go to a car fire chief? Go ahead. Don't take command. Let the captain run the damn thing. How is that captain going to learn to move up, okay? Uh, so, and, and, again, this I'm, I'm barely even touching the surface right, of this. Right, right, right. But in the interest of time, that, that that's, you know, as a probie, shut up and listen. As a company officer, pay attention and lead. Take care of your people. Force them to do things they don't want to do in a manner where they're looking forward to it. Right? The old Irish saying, tell people to go to hell. And then they look forward to the trip, right? <laughs> And then the uh, and the chief, sir, understand it. You know, you've got the bigger picture. Yeah. You got to be the supreme command officer. You got to be the best there is. That's my whole mission. I've not worked a hearse tool in since 1982. I've not stretched a hose line since 1982. But dude, I can work a pen and a radio as good as anybody. <laughs> and that's my responsibility. You know what I hate that's- when I'm in a house taking care of something, and next thing I know, I feel over my right shoulder a fire chief. Right, and without mentioning any names, I, I'll. There's a fire chief there, so. And you're you're using a fictional example. Of course, of yeah. course, fictional. Okay. But two things happen in my mind. One, does this man trust my ability? Right, because if if he does, I don't know why he's in here. Yeah. And and secondly, what does that say to my crew about me? You know, is my is my crew looking at at my chief going? Hmm, is Maybe he doesn't trust uh, right. Frank's decisions right. in here, right. you know. Right. So it's frustrating, and, and I'd much rather be able to take care of business, come out, and hey, go, Chief, this is what I got. This is what I prepared to do. And like you said, and I loved it. I loved it. You were like, well, if there's a problem afterwards. You tell him, hey, I would have done it this way. Or I would have done it. If it now, listen, if it's a scream emergency, fix life right hazard, now. life hazard, fix it immediately. And the chief has to have that discretion, and that can't get anybody angry. Bottom line, the chief's responsible. Right. But if it's constant, it's all the time. The chief needs to look themselves in the mirror and ask her or himself, is this really what I want to do? I miss being a captain. I was better at that. Like I told you before, I w- I've been the chief for a total of um, uh, about four, 15 years, the chief. I'm much better with less bugles, much better. I'm good with three or four bugles, five. <laughs> I, I'm just not. I, I cannot get along but with that's, the people. Above that's self evaluation. Piece of cake, man. I, every almost every firefighter or every chief, fire chief. I apologize. I have interview have said to me their favorite position was captain. Yeah, I, you know, I like being in the car. I've been in the car a long time. I haven't run the front seat of. I haven't ridden the front seat of a rig since 1982. Wow. I mean, I may have once in a while. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. But I am. But it's I'm, a totally different role. I'm not. I mean, we get to a scene. I watch our people work miracles, uh, our paramedic firefighters, our rescue technicians. I'm just in awe, you know. Sometimes they don't even need me to supervise. I take pictures and stuff. Uh, but we're there if they need us. Sure. You're that resource. You're that the home run. Well, and I'm just making sure nobody's going to get themselves hurt if the captain needs anything. I don't need to be in command. I don't need to get in there where they're digging at the patient. What the hell do I know? Right. But I can certainly help coordinate that incident. Chief. I cannot thank you enough for coming oh, on my little pleasure. show. I enjoyed it. This was such a good time, man. I, yeah. It was so fun just to have the opportunity to actually talk to Do you. Do it again sometime. Thanks so much, man. My pleasure. I know I you got to get to get some eating, but before you go, I have some gifts for you. You know, <laughs> okay, you, you can't leave your empty-handed for sure. Great. So um, a buddy of mine who I met through this show, uh-huh. um, you talk about these guys that just want to do the right thing yeah, and help out. Yeah. So Sal, uh, who owns Eagle Emblems and Graphics. at a Sal for 20 years. So you know Sal. Sure. Oh, man. Well, <laughs> Sal's a sweetheart. Dude, he reached out to me, and he says, hey, man, I love what you're doing. You know, I'd love to kind of be a part of it. So what he does is he makes these patches. Very nice. For, so every one of my guests gets one of those patches. And I don't give him yeah, out. Sal and his mom and dad. <laughs> no, he's such an amazing man. But, yeah. but again, he, he made those for me free. Very, charge, very didn't charge nice. me a dime. And I know what it takes to, I've you know. I've done tons of stuff with Sal. He's great. He's a good man. So, so now you have one of those patches. Eagle Emblems is who we're talking Yeah, about. Eagle Emblems are great. I always put his logo up Staten for helping Island. me out. Right. And then I have some, some decals Thank for you, you from the same place. Thanks. And then uh, this, this is a decal that we just, I just made. It's for my show. And it's No One Fights Alone. That's very nice, yeah. Especially between the mental health issues and yes. the cancers. We didn't even get to touch on no, absolutely, cancer yeah. today, but maybe uh, another time. I, listen, together. anytime you want to come back on my little show, my little show <laughs> you by all means are important well, to come. Uh, if I can do anything, I want to share my enthusiasm with people that maybe are starting to lose it and maybe get pumped back up again. You certainly inspired me on this. Bottom line is when the tones go off, we go. And I know. In my house, I have nine different receivers, so I always know when the tones go off. <laughs> you miss the no job. That's the show. Nothing, no way. Well, here I am at Indianapolis at the FDIC 2019. Uh, Absolute honor for me to be here. And we'll be back soon.